Um, I won't give a um, lengthy introduction this um, uh, this evening, other than to welcome you all as we continue um, to have Adam Smith week. And I um, encourage you all to come and check out a variety of events that we're going to continue to have over the course of the week. On um, tomorrow afternoon, we will be having a panel in this room at three, uh, actually in Take 202, I believe, at uh, three o'clock on criminal justice reform. Um, and we have three excellent speakers to come and talk on that topic. And then in the tomorrow evening, we have um, Dr. Rachel Ferguson talking on um, black liberalization and, and, um, and the free markets. So um, I just want to um, go ahead and now bring up one of our market process scholars, um, Christian Collins, to introduce our speaker for this evening. Hey everybody, um, so Dr. Don Boudreau, uh, um, earned a PhD in economics at the Univers uh, Auburn University, excuse me, and a law degree from the University of Virginia. Uh, he's a senior fellow with the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study, a center board member, and holds the Martha and Nelson Getchell Chair for the Study of Free Market Capitalism, all at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Um, he has also previously served as president of the Foundation for Economic Education and as an associate professor of legal studies and economics at Clemson University. Dr. Boudreaux uh, specializes in globalization and trade, law and economics, and antitrust economics. He has a commitment to make economics more accessible uh, and lectured across the United States, uh, Canada, Latin America, and Europe, and having published the books uh, Hypocrites and Hackwits, A Daily Dose of Sanity from Cafe Hayek, and another entitled Globalization. His articles have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, uh, in US News and World Report, as well as numerous scholar scholarly journals. Uh, he has a blog entitled Cafe Hayek and a regular column in the Pittsburgh Tribune Review. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Don Boutreau. First test for your speaker is if he can operate the technology. I'm feeling the test. Get a skate. All right, thank you. Thanks for, for being here. I am told that I shouldn't wander too far away from my podium. So I'm gonna throw some barriers that will remind you. <laughs> it's, a, it's an effective device. So this is my second time speaking uh, at uh, the Adam Smith event. I thank uh, Pete for inviting me. I was last here nine, nine years ago. Um, as some of you in this room know, uh, I, I love Charleston. I fell in love with Charleston when I was at Clemson University many years ago. I used to tell people that, uh, as people don't know what Clemson is, you know, Clemson is, but they know what Charleston is. Clemson is about as far away as you can be from Charleston, South Carolina, and still be in the state of South Carolina. And they would get an idea of where, where Clemson is. But anyway, I used to come down here quite a lot and uh, fell in love with the, with the place. I'm from New Orleans. It reminds me of the best of New Orleans without uh, much of what I find to be creepy about New Orleans. But I'm here today to talk to you about, about my uh, dear and much missed late colleague, Walter Williams. Uh, some of you, maybe all of you were here for the earlier uh, 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 presentation of the the video biography that was made of Walter about uh, 10 or 11 years ago by the Free to Choose Network. Uh, so I'm going to talk, try not to be too repetitive of that. Uh, so uh, um, the way I thought I'd structure my talk tonight is around this theme. This is a 
topic that a term that's much used today. But is there systemic racism? Is systemic racism a thing? And if so, is it something we should worry about? I know from having conversations with Walter not long before he died that he explicitly denied that there was such a thing as systemic racism. But I don't think he really meant it. I think he believed he meant it. It's, it's not, I hope you don't think me unseemly to be questioning the thoughts of a much revered man who's now no longer with us. But the reason he didn't, the reason he rejected the term uh, it, it is because being a good economist, he didn't like the implication that we could explain observed social outcomes, observed economic outcomes by looking at intentions. And when Walter saw this term, he saw it as an attempt to explain economic outcomes by means of intentions. And no good economist explains things according to the intentions. We look at the actual incentives and constraints the cost and benefits that people face. We try to explain the outcomes by looking at those. We, we don't deny that intentions exist, but they're usually a very poor way to explain observed outcomes. So when Walter rejected, as I know he did uh, 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 to me and to others face to face, uh, he may have done so also in print. I suspect he did actually, but I haven't, I haven't yet seen it. What he was rejecting is not, as I will argue tonight, He's not rejecting the notion that there are institutions in society that promote outcomes that have a, uh, a, 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 a racial bias to them. He doesn't deny that. Much of his work was devoted to explaining how that comes about, how racial bias comes about through these dysfunctional or perverse institutional outcomes. But he did deny that we can explain race, but we, we can explain uh, 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 observed differences along racial lines or along gender lines or along sexual preference lines, you name the lines. He did deny that we can explain these looking at intentions only. Uh, I like a, uh, 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 an example that I learned from Walter uh, back in the late 1980s, Walter and I, I was then a young assistant professor at George Mason. I remember talking to Walter once. We were talking about the, the, the uh, uh, unease we get when we hear people explain things with intentions. And, 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 and I use this example today, still to this day in my class. I stole it from Walter. Uh, and here's Walter's example. He says, you know, if you're walking along 34th Street in Manhattan, Imagine doing that. It's a bright, beautiful day. You look up and you see someone fall. And you, you watch them and you, they meet the bitter end. And then, of course, the cops are going to come up. They're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're, they want to know what happened. So people are milling around the dead body. Here come the police. Back then, when Walter told me, so police had paper and pencil in hand. Now you're seeing their iPads. Probably. So, so the police want to know did, did anybody witness what happened? And uh, 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 you raise your hand and you say, I know what happened. I know why the person fell. And please come over to you because I want to get your explanation. And you say, gravity. Gravity is why the person died. And of course, it's true in a very literal sense. If it weren't for gravity, the person would still be levitating over 34th Street in Manhattan would die of starvation rather than of trauma. But of course, that's not a really good explanation. The economist, and Walter was a very good economist, assumes always that individuals are self-interested. Not to say greedy or venal, not to say that in individuals are always interested only in crass material possessions or only in accumulating as much monetary wealth as possible. But we are self-interested. I care more about me, my loved ones, and my friends than I care about strangers. Same is true for you, same is true for everybody else in the world. So the 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 uh, self-interest doesn't matter. It's a, it is a, it's very much like um, trying to explain why, say, prices rise after a hurricane strikes Charleston, why prices rise after a tornado devastates a Midwestern town, 
try, try to explain those by relying on greed is to try to explain something like it, it, very much akin to trying to explain why the person died when he or she fell from the Empire State Building by saying gravity. It's just always there. It's not much of an explanation. It's just a background reality that doesn't change. So Walt just said, let's get beyond these sort of simplistic attempts to explain economic realities, observe economic realities by looking at motives. Let's look at, at constraints. So that's what I'm going to do for most of my talk tonight, but I just want to share with, with some of you a little bit about Walter before I do that, about Walter personally. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you saw what he early, for the earlier session, but uh, uh, he was an economist trained at UCLA. UCLA at the time he was trained there in the 1960s uh, was one of the best economics programs, PhD economics programs in the country. His training was first rate. He studied under the great economist, late economist Armin Alchian, who's one of the finest economists who ever lived. And Armin Alchian taught Walter Williams the hard headed way of looking at, at the world, of, of looking, of being very fierce and intrepid and always looking for the underlying constraints rather than relying upon explanations based upon motives. He moved to George Mason in 1980. Um, and I moved to George Mason for my first job in 1985. That's when I first met him. And for reasons that I don't quite fully understand, but I'm grateful for, he and I became very close friends. Um, he was one of my closest friends on the faculty. I think I was one of his closest friends on the faculty. And the day that he died, December 2nd, uh, 2020, um, will always be for me a very gloomy, gloomy day. So let's look at uh, some of, Walter would not want me to stand here and just mourn. He didn't want me to get to the economics. So let's look at some of the economics that Walter uh, advanced. This is his first book. It's the first thing I read by Walter. It's a 1982 book called The State Against against Blacks, and the, the, the title is pretty descriptive of what the book is about. This book, like pretty much everything else Walter wrote, is amazingly accessible. It's written in plain language, even though he has data in there, he presents the data and describes the data in ways that any reasonably intelligent person can follow. You don't need a PhD in economics to follow it. It was one of his great talents to, it was, was to make relatively complex economic ideas accessible to a general uh, and wide audience. This book was a, a big hit. Uh, it it uh, drew for Walter a lot of attention. He was already getting some by the time the book was published 40 years ago, but it enabled him to, to get even more attention uh, in the public sphere. So he goes through in this book various ways uh, in which state government erected policies have a negative impact, a disproportionately negative impact on minorities, particularly blacks. Uh, his follow-up book uh, in this vein is one that was written in 2011 called Race and Economics. I recommend them both. Unfortunately, the state against blacks is no longer in print. This one is in print and it's available on Amazon at pretty reasonable. Right. So let's look at some of the economics. Let's look first at minimum wages, which Walter discussed in the in the video that some of you saw earlier. But it's it's it's, it's important to look at it again. First, let's do some basic uh, labor economics. Pause for minute, some basic labor economics. A worker uh, who is underpaid is like a hundred dollar bill laying on the sidewalk. You were walking along the sidewalk and you saw a $100 bill with no obvious owner. What do you do? Do you A, stoop to pick it up, or B, walk on by? What do you do? What would you do, Christian? I'd stoop to pick it up. Yeah, yeah, so would I, even though my income is higher than yours. I'd stoop to pick it up too, right? Because I'm a self interested person and you're a self interested person. I'm not stealing it from anybody, but it's a, it's, a, it's, it's purchasing power right there in the ground, ready to be taken. A worker who is underpaid, every worker who is underpaid is just like that. So the first thing to know about labor markets, competitive labor markets, in most markets in the United States, labor markets are competitive. 
is that any worker who is currently underpaid is a profit opportunity. And so some self-interested business person is going to come along and try to bid that person away, just like self-interested person is picking up the $100 bill on the sidewalk. So let's say that, uh, um, so let's say that uh, uh, I'm a 16-year-old, and most 16-year-olds have no skills, of course. I'm a 16-year-old. Let's say that I can produce $10 of value for an employer, but I'm currently being paid $7. I don't know any better. I'm a 16 year old. I'm reasonably happy with my $7 an hour wage. I'm working maybe at McDonald's. The Burger King manager across the street sees what I'm being paid. The Burger King manager across the street doesn't care about me. Not mean to me, but Burger King manager just wants to make money, wants to have his store be as profitable as possible. He knows that I'm being paid only $7 an hour, but I'm producing $10 an hour for. for the McDonald's store. So the Burger King manager comes up to me and says, come work for me, I'll pay you $7.25. That's great. What's the McDonald's manager going to do? It's not going to say, go away, because I'm producing, remember, for this McDonald's $10 an hour worth of value. The McDonald's manager will say, no, 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 I'll pay you $7.50. My wage gets bid up to reflect my productivity. There's a technical economics explanation here. It reflects the value of my marginal product, marginal productivity. That's a curly Q we don't have to concern ourselves with. In competitive labor markets, wages get bid up to reflect workers' productivity. Of course, employers would like to pay as little as possible, but they don't. Because employers who try to pay as little as possible and stubbornly keep wages down lose valuable workers and they wind up losing money. So competitive pressures compel employers to push wages up. I once did an experiment. I mentioned earlier I'm from, that I'm from New Orleans. I once did an experiment I really did this um, uh, about, uh, I guess it was about 10 years ago. So from New Orleans, I have a couple of sports um, uh, 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 loyalties. I went to Auburn, so I'm an Auburn football fan. Uh, and I'm from New Orleans, so I'm a New Orleans Saints football fan, which was a dreary experience until about 15 years ago. Uh, so the New Orleans Saints, some of you might know, hired, they, they hired they, they, on the free agent market, they grabbed this quarterback named Drew Brees. It was really wonderful. So when they got Drew Brees, they finally started winning games. About 10 years ago, he was one of the highest paid quarterbacks in the, in the NFL. The year I'm talking about, I remember his salary was just over $20 million a year. 20 plus a year. Uh, so you know, why, why are the Saints paying this guy $20 million a year? Because they love Drew Brees? No, it's because he can produce that much output for him. And I proved it. All right. Gave some evidence to that effect. I wrote to Mickey Loomis. He's the general manager of the Saints. I wrote him an email. The dear, my name is Don Boudreau. At the time, I was in my early 50s. Uh, really love the Saints. Um, in reasonably good health. I offered to quarterback your team all year long. <laughs> and, I, and I'll only ask $100,000. That would have been really cool. I would have loved to play quarterback in the NFL for 16 games for $100,000. Think of the savings, uh, $19,900,000 the Saints would have saved, plus some change by hiring me as a quarterback. I did not get a reply from Mr. <laughs> Loomis, shockingly enough. It's because I'm not very productive. I, 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 I would be a terrible quarterback in the NFL. Uh, I would be worth negative money. I'd have to pay a huge sum of money to have an NFL team higher. So the reason we see sports stars salaries as high as they are is because those salaries reflect the value to their employers of their productivity. The reason we also see low-skilled workers being paid wages as little as they are paid is because those workers have very low skills. They are not worth more than the wages that they are paid. We have some evidence that uh, Weight pay keeps track of productivity. The uh, uh, blue line is a measure of productivity per hour. The red line, which is the one that you should look at, is total compensation per hour. The green line is wages. But what's happened over the years, including for low skilled workers, by the way, is that the portion of wages paid in terms of uh, fringe benefits has increased. 
In part, this is because of health insurance issues, but it's increased. Uh, and so the red line shows pay wages plus fringe benefits. And as you can see, it starts in 1948, it goes up through 2018. Pay keeps track pretty much with worker productivity. There are gaps in it, it'll close a little bit, it'll, it, 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 it widens sometimes. But for the, over the course of 70 years, it keeps track of productivity. Now, this is all labor in the United States, but what's true for all labor is true for subgroups of labor. It's true for 16 and 17 year olds and teenagers, the people who are most affected by the minimum wage. By the way, well, it's not a big enough group to ask. When I, in, in, in the years BC before COVID, when I actually had students in my class, I would ask them, I teach freshmen mostly, 18 year olds. I would ask them, how many workers in America, what percentage of the American workforce earns the minimum wage? So I, I usually have 328 students in my class. I get hands raised and I, I start calling. And anybody here want to guess? Anybody, any students want to guess what the percentage of the American workforce is paid the minimum wage? Tom? Four percent? Christian, you want to guess? Two percent. Wow, you people are really smart. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 it varies. And last time I checked, it was 3.9%. Right? So it's pretty close pretty close to four. I had to check last about a year ago. So it'll, sometimes it'll be a little lower, sometimes it'll be a little bit higher. But a lot of the answers that you get are 20%, 50%, 70% I once got. They're all minimum wage workers. Uh, the vast majority of Americans get paid wages higher than the minimum. Uh, and the people who get paid the minimum are almost all, there are exceptions. They are, they are overwhelmingly young people. The single biggest portion of them are teenagers. And the way the labor market works is you, you get your first job because you're, you're 16 years old and you have no skills. You have no record. As far as your employer knows, you really can't produce much beyond a very minimum amount. So you're going to get paid a very low wage. You get that first job, you get skills, you de demonstrate a willingness to show up for work on time and to be a cooperative fellow employee. You get a reputation for having more skills, your wages rise. I, the, the last time I checked, the typical worker who gets paid the minimum wage in the United States uh, gets a raise within just over nine months after getting that job. And there are exceptions, of course. The news media are skilled at finding uh, uh, people in their 30s uh, who have been in the job market for 12 years who are still getting paid the minimum wage. Those are really rare people. They are not the norm by any means. So anyway, given that competitive labor markets compel firms to pay workers what they are worth, if the minimum wage pushes requires employers to pay wages higher than worker than some workers are currently being paid the result has to be says economics has to be that some workers find themselves in a worse position some of them lose jobs altogether some of the jobs that they held become worse the, the, the bosses become more demanding they have they demand more output from the workers they become the bosses become less a uh, 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 lenient in, in allowing workers to arrive late, allowing workers to leave early, allowing workers to do personal texting and telephoning while on the job. And so the, the, the effect of the minimum wage is basically to destroy jobs for those skilled workers. There are, I know some economists in the, in, in the audience, and there is one theoretically uh, valid exception to what I just said, and that's if labor markets are characterized by monopsony power, meaning that employers of low skilled workers uh, have monopoly power over those workers, those workers have no alternatives. I think that's an absurd uh, uh, argument to, uh, as, as it applies to reality. There aren't many benefits of being a low skilled worker. One of the few benefits of being a low skilled worker is that you don't uh, supply anything that's highly specialized. So if your current employer is abusing you, refusing to pay you, Enough, it's very easy to take your, your 
minimal skills and move them elsewhere in the economy. So no employer has any monopoly power over you. So Walter spent a lot of time analyzing the minimum wage, both theoretically and empirically. And he came to the conclusion that, that, that most economists still come to, about 70% of economists who study the minimum wage still come to the conclusion that yes, indeed, it does cause unemployment among the very groups you would expect it to cause unemployment, and that is low-skilled workers. But the problem is even worse. So the standard way economists tell the story is this. All right, well, uh, when the minimum wage goes up, some workers lose their jobs because they are priced out of the labor market. It's no longer profitable for employers to hire those workers. Their incomes fall from whatever they were before to zero because you don't make any money if you're unemployed. But some workers gain. And it is true that some workers gain. Some workers, because some workers do have wages that are higher as a result of the minimum wage. Because the minimum wage, by reducing the effective number of, of low skilled workers who are working, actually raises the productivity of the, of the remaining few who continue to work. But it's not random. This distribution of the costs and benefits of the minimum wage is not random. It's not like God flips a coin and says, okay, when the minimum wage gets imposed, uh, you people, you're, you, you are the ones who lose jobs and you other people are the ones who keep jobs at higher wages. Economics is pretty clear that the distributional effects of the, of, of, of the negative consequences of the minimum wage uh, are, they cut predictably along racial lines. Walter said in the video earlier today, uh, but I'll repeat it for those of you who aren't. Well, what, one reason I, I have this, uh, one reason that it's so easy for uh, employers of low skilled workers to not have those workers when the minimum wage rises, it's very easy to mechanize the simple tasks that low skilled workers do. Um, oh, I thought I had. I guess no. Oh, yes, it's out of place. Excuse me. So, in 1948, and if you're interested, I can tell you why that takes relevant. In 1948, the unemployment rate of whites age 16 and 17 was 10.2 percent. The unemployment rate of blacks was 9.4 percent. In 1980, when Walter wrote um, the state against blacks, the unemployment rate of whites was 18.5. White teenagers, 18.5 percent. Blacks, 37.7 percent. So, in the course of those 32 years. The unemployment rate of young white workers went from being slightly higher than that of young black workers to being much lower than that of young black workers. Today, 2022, I couldn't find any the data on 16 and 17 year olds for today. So this is the best I could do. Because this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, 16 to 24 year olds, young workers, the unemployment rate for white young workers is 8.9%. The unemployment rate for black young workers in that age group is 13.6%. So how do we explain this? The typical explanation for why the black unemployment rate is higher than the white unemployment rate is racism. It's equivalent to the greed explanation for why prices rise. It's racism. It must be racism, right? But that doesn't make any sense because in 1948, the unemployment rate for whites was higher than the unemployment rate for blacks, unless someone, unless someone wants to argue, and I would not want to be the person who does this, that the United States has become more racist over the past 70 odd years, then these data don't square with the racism argument. What does square with it is the minimum wage argument. Now, the minimum wage that we have in the United States was first enacted in 1938, it's a Fair Labor Standards. Act, but you know a little history, you know that right after 1938, war breaks out in Europe. The United States is involved in that war in 1941. Uh, so uh, uh, economists are pretty clear that the first 10 years of the national minimum wage, the data that we have on it are not very reliable because it's, most of that was a wartime economy. But even when we weren't at war, the United States government was buying up material, including textiles to ship to Europe. So it wasn't until the, after the war, after World War II, when we moved back to a privatized civilian economy that we really get good data, 
reliable data on the effects of the minimum wage. So that's why we start with 1948. And so in that year, again, whites had a lower, a higher unemployment rate than, than did blacks. Over the course of that, those 70 odd years, of course, the minimum wage has, has gone up. Uh, it, sometimes in real work value, inflation has decreased it. Walter explains, I think he's correct. Walter explains the, diff, the rising difference in black unemployment, teenage black unemployment, to white teenage unemployment as the result of the minimum wage. So if racism doesn't explain it. You can't explain the racism. You can't explain it by looking at when minimum wages go up. It's interesting, by the way, I don't know if you know the, the history. Walter liked this history. He and I spoke about it. Um, I said we got the minimum wage in 1938. South Carolina actually you know, is significant in this story, not this part so much, but, but the upstate of South Carolina. Um, so if you don't know any history, you might think that, well, in 1938, because we had Franklin Roosevelt in the White House, who was a friend of the poor. So it must have been the case that by 1938, the federal government became very interested in helping poor workers. And so poor workers and their champions went to Washington and said, President Roosevelt, members of Congress, pass the minimum wage to raise the wages for low skilled workers. But that's not what happened. If you look at the actual record of who lobbied for the minimum wage, you find two groups. One, owners of textile mills in New England. What are they doing lobbying for a minimum wage? Owners of textile mills in New England. Number two, union representatives of workers in those textile mills in New England. Why are these people in New England lobbying for a minimum wage. Were these workers in New England? Were the unionized workers underpaid? Kind of odd for a labor union to be lobbying for a minimum wage. It's sort of a confession that they're not doing their job for their workers. The average pay in a New England textile in 1938, by our standards, was pretty low, but for the day it was Adjusted to 2022 dollars, probably about six bucks an hour. It was just over 25 cents an hour in 1938. The average pay, hourly pay for operations workers in southern textile mills in the Carolinas and in North Georgia, the average pay there was 15 cents an hour. Here's what happened the northern textile mills, for reasons that I, I, I do not know, but you, it's, it, it, I don't know of any exception to it. Whenever a region starts to industrialize, textiles lead the way. That was true in Great Britain, it's true in the United States, it's true all over the world. For some reason, textile mills arise. So the United States North industrialized before the United States South, of course, we get textile mills in Pennsylvania and in New England. Civil War happens. Finally, in the late 19th century, the American South begins to enter the modern world. Textile mills arise. By the early part of the 20th century, these textile mills are popping up all over the American South. Well, in, in the upstate of South Carolina, North Carolina, and North Georgia. The Northern textile mills, they were unhappy with this. They were losing market share. If you're an owner of a textile mill in Fall River, uh, uh, Massachusetts, you can't go to your congressman and say, I don't like the competition from the South. Well, you can do that, but you don't want to be in revenue. If you, go, if you go to your congressman and say, you know, we're losing business to those Southern textile mills. I don't like that fact. Your congressman in 1930 would say, well, what can I do about it? I can't outlaw Southern textile mills op operating. No, oh, you're right, you can't do that. What can we do? Well, what are their advantage? Why are they gaining market share over you? And the Northern textile mill owner says, well, they have lower wages. They pay lower wages. Ah. Why don't we mandate that they pay wages as high as you have to pay? What's your wage? 25 cents an hour. Just over 25 cents an hour. What's their wage? 15 cents an hour. Let's pass the minimum wage. First minimum wage when it was enacted in 1930 was 25 cents an hour. There's no doubt that the purpose of the first minimum wage was to handicap the southern textile mills in order to protect the markets for the northeastern textile mills. And nothing to do with helping workers. It's also true 
course, that a lot of workers in the southern textile mills were a high, much higher proportion of workers in the southern textile mills compared to workers in the northern textile mills were black. Sharecropping is not a very good way to make a living. It's a pretty grueling lifestyle. And so even though working for 15 cents an hour in a textile mill in Dalton, Georgia, might not be any of our idea of a grand life. It's much better than sharecropping. So a lot of these sharecroppers would find what for them would be much better jobs in the Southern textiles. That enabled the Southern textiles to keep their costs low. They structured their production so that it was heavily labor intensive. And they were taking demand away from the Northeastern textiles. The minimum wage was intended, was intended not to help old school workers, it was intended to help rich textile mill owners and their relatively highly paid unionized workers at the expense of much poorer Southern workers who happen to be black. The implication here, I talked to Walter about this. He doesn't believe, he didn't believe that it was an anti-black law. It just had that impact. It was a, it was a, a, a special interest piece of legislation designed to help one particular powerful special interest group, Northeastern textile mill owners, uh, but happened to have a disproportionately negative impact on poor workers in the South and poor workers in the South were disproportionately black. So the negative consequence of the minimum wage was disproportionately harmful to black workers. And we see that effect continuing today. If you're an employer, there are two ways to tell the story, two versions of the story, each of which is valid, but I think one becomes more valid over time. If you're an employer, and, and most of the job, most of the firms that hire low skilled workers are in highly competitive industries. Restaurants, retail, these are not industries with high profit margins. If these, if these firms don't make, uh, uh, don't keep their costs as low as possible, they're out of business. They get shut down. So the managers and owners of these firms have to be very careful about their costs. So any firm that tried to behave tried to hire on the basis of something other than economic necessity, economic rationality, would be outcompeted by firms that, that, that uh, behave more economically reasonably. And so one possibility for why we see a disproportionately negative impact of the minimum wage on blacks compared to that of whites is that it allows bigoted people, it allows prejudiced people, to express their prejudice without having to pay for it. If I have to pay by law, $7.25 an hour, and if as a result, I, I have, let's say I have one job opening and I have three candidates, and let's say they're all equally qualified, but let's say that I'm biased against, I'll pick a, a different uh, character. Let's say I'm biased against people who I think are gay, and I see the candidates out there, and I spot, uh, spot one who I think is gay, I'm not gonna hire that person. And that person cannot then say, well, to me, look, hire me because I'll work for a lower price because it's illegal. So the minimum wage allows people with racial prejudices to express those preferences free of charge. But even if people, even if employers don't have racial bigotry in their blood, it's still, the minimum wage does have negative, disproportionate negative impact on minority communities. You're an, employ you're an employer in a highly competitive industry. You're running a restaurant. You're running a Burger King franchise. You're, you're, you're managing a Walmart. It's really competitive. You got to watch your costs, every penny that you spend. You have a couple of job openings for low skill workers. You have some candidates come in. And let's just assume you have zero prejudice against anyone. You don't care if they're gay, black, white, green. You don't, you, you don't care. You truly don't. But you do care about how likely your workers are to be productive. So you have the various candidates come to you. One candidate uh, is from uh, a middle class family in a leafy neighborhood with really good public schools. Another candidate is from the inner city, broken home, didn't go to very good public schools. Which candidate are you going to choose? You're going to choose the candidate from the leafy suburb, not because you're prejudiced. But because that candidate is likely to be more productive over time than the other candidate. 
And the other candidate, by law, is not allowed to offer to work for you at a lower wage to compensate for his or her handicap on that front. So even if employers have no prejudice at all, one consequence of the minimum wage is indeed to cut negatively and disproportionately along racial lines. And I think you still see that in the data. Let's go on to some other. I, I could talk about the minimum wage all, all day long because it's a particular interest. Uh, this is a book I just want to draw your attention to. It has nothing to do with Walter, although I know he admired the book. This is by uh, uh, it's a 1977 book by the economic historian Robert Gates called Competition and Coercion. Probably can't read it, but the subtitle is Glass in the American Economy, 1865 to 1914. What Bob Higgs does in this book is, and it's data rich, and he looks at how blacks were faring from the end of the US Civil War up until World War I. What he finds, surprisingly, is that along many, many measures, blacks were improving. Competition was driving black wages higher. Competition was reducing the differences in black, white, unemployment rates. Competition was raising blacks disproportionately to whites. Whites were being raised too, because the economy was growing, but the, most of the benefits were going, or disproportionate share of the benefits were going to whites, uh, me, going to blacks. Until, until Jim Crow legislation came along, particularly in the 1890s. Jim Crow legislation, you should ask, why did we have Jim Crow legislation? Why did government actually have to pass statutes in order to outlaw competition uh, of black workers or jobs held by white workers? Why did government have to pass statutes to outlaw blacks sitting in the front of the bus? It's because in the absence of those statutes, those things weren't happening. Bigoted people could not rely upon the market to allow them to consume their preference for prejudice because the market wasn't supplying it. It's simply too costly for producers to supply it. And it was disappearing. Bigoted people had to go to government. They had to use the power of state coercion in order to force businesses to give special privileges to whites. I don't think that's documented any better. It's not the only place, but that's one of the places where it's documented really well. Um, occupational licensing. Uh, so you know what this is. This is where the government enacts statutes and says, well, you are not allowed to uh, braid hair, you are not allowed to cut hair, you are not allowed to mow lawns, you are not allowed to do X, Y, and Z unless you have a license from the government. But we're doing it because we care about you. Why would you think otherwise? We care about your safety. We care about the quality of the product that you get. So as, as a requirement for getting one of our licenses, uh, the, 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 the people who want the license, they have to pass rigorous tests so that we can ensure High quality. It sounds good. Well, that's great. I mean, when I when I go get my hair braided, I don't have an incompetent hair braider braiding my hair. I would be a pretty skilled hair braider that to braid my hair. But I, if I go to get my, uh, my, my my one of my favorite occupational licensing stories is the 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 licensing of interior designers in Texas. For a number of years, we had to have a license to be an interior designer in Texas. You just could be any old person said who offered interior design services. Uh, uh, but the actual impact of these requirements is not only that to not really increase safety very much in many cases, they don't even work on their own terms in most cases. The desired impact, however, is to raise the pay of those who are politically astute enough to be the incumbents who get the protection of the occupational licensing restrictions and to exclude those people who are not allowed to get the licenses. In other words, the safety concerns and the testing, these are all ruses to artificially restrict the number of people who practice whatever occupation is licensed. That results in higher pay for those protected professions, people in those protected professions. It results in the exclusion from those professions of people who can't get licenses, and it results in higher prices for 
consumers. In the State Against Blacks, one of my favorite stories that Walter tells, State Against Blacks. Oh, so this is the number of states uh, 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 that this is the percentage of low wage professions subject to licensing according to states. It's huge. So in California, for example, uh, it's over, uh, I think it's 61, over 61% 61 of low wage occupations, like shoe shine, things like that. You have to have a license from the state in order to do that occupation. So a poor person who wants to get started in life by doing a low wage, low skill job, is often excluded from doing that because that person can't get a license from the state in order to give, uh, in order to get the permission to sell his or her services uh, uh, to voluntary buyers. So, license, occupation licensing, <clears throat> excuse me, has actually been increasing over the years since Walter wrote. But one of my favorite stories is uh, a study that he reports on. So, you think occupation licensing? Well, uh, some people will say, well, okay, it raises prices because it restricts the number of people who practice the occupation, but maybe it does improve safety. There was a study done, I think in 1977, and published uh, by the Bureau of Economic Research, study looking across states at the intensity of the regulation of people applying the trade of the electrician. So some states were really strict in allowing people to get a license to work as an electrician. So only the most skilled, highly trained, competent people who are electricians can get a license to be an electrician in those states. Other states are a little bit more blasé. And the requirements aren't quite as strict. So these authors ranked states according to how strict the states were in, in requiring uh, skills at being an electrician to get a license to practice as an electrician. So you think, right, that, well, even though the, it's harder to be an electrician in a state in which it's more difficult to get a license, it's, and, and although it's more expensive to hire an electrician in those states, at least then that state would get the benefit of having uh, a, a safer system of electricity. I'm not sure what to call that. Um, but in fact, it's the opposite. The higher the more restrictive the regime in allowing people to get licensed as electricians, the higher the rate of homeowner electrocutions. States in which it was relatively easy to get a license to practice as an electrician are states in which there were relatively fewer people being electrocuted at home. Anybody want to guess why? Yourself. Yeah. You want to pay higher price for the yeah. electrician. Yeah. 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 So, you know, if, if hiring a skilled electrician costs not very much, you hire the skilled electrician and you get professional work. But if the price is really high, and the very goal of the occupational licensing, of course, is to raise the price of electricians, that price is really high, if you have to pay a really high price. To it. Yeah, but I'm going to do it myself. It's very difficult to outlaw people doing the electrical work. So, you get all this home electrical work. So, People electrocute themselves. It's very difficult themselves. It's very difficult for me to find an appropriate picture here, one that wasn't too macabre. <laughs> I was wondering if uh, I mean that sounds like a plausible explanation. Another explanation is some states have more dangerous kind of electricity. Maybe there's more heating and HVAC stuff there, so there's just more going on, and they need the the stronger uh, licensing requirements because there's this background of just way more dangerous electrical work. So I remember reading this paper. I came across this 1977 NDER paper when I saw it cited in Walter's book. So I, and I read his book in 1984, and I remember re finding the paper and reading it. It's been a long time since I read it, so I have a good excuse for not remembering everything in the paper. But it, my recollection is they controlled for a fair amount. Right. Um, uh, I don't know that they control for everything, as you probably know. It's very, it's almost impossible to correct and do the perfect empirical study. But they were aware of that issue. Um, and but the, the 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 findings are very striking in this paper. The stricter the regulate, the stricter the occupational licensing requirements, the more dangerous it is to live in a home. You know, in, in that state, you're more likely to get electrocuted or suffer some some, some sort of severe electrical injury. 
I know I'm I'm speaking uh, too long here. Let's go on to uh, so rent control. I used to live uh, for five four years. I lived in Westchester County, New York, back in the very late nineties and early part of nineteen ninety seven to two thousand. Uh, that's about 15 miles north of Manhattan. It's on the Hudson River. It's beautiful. It's very uh, 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 elegant. And I would often take the train from Irvington down to Manhattan. It's about a 40 minute train ride, if I remember. I, I, I do it often, at least once a week, go to, go to Manhattan at business. It's a Metro North train. And it was always striking to me. Now, I haven't ridden this train in, in, in 20 years. I assume things are still the same, but here's what I saw in very late 20th century, very early part of the 21st century. It has always struck me when I was on this train. Going down the Hudson River, it's beautiful, it's, it's mint. The Hudson River uh, off, to the, off to the west, mansions off to the east. And suddenly as you get closer to Manhattan, across the river, and you're looking at uh, uh, one window, you're looking at Harlem, the other window, you're looking at the South Bronx. And it was devastation. It was tall buildings, Sissy and Menard, both sides of the river, tall buildings. They were gutted until there were squatters living in them. And this went on for blocks and blocks, and then you get to Manhattan, of course, to go to Grand Central Station. But there was this part of the ride where you would see just utterly an utterly devastated urban landscape. And this is kind of weird, right? Manhattan is 22 square miles from some of the most valuable 22 square miles of real estate in human history. And why in the late 20th century or early 21st century, I, my guess is still today, although I can't say for sure, why is so much of the real estate there so decrepit? It looked literally third world. Terrible. And the answer, I mean, I knew it then. The answer is rent control. Rent control is a good name among a lot of people. It keeps rents low, right? No, it reduces the supply of housing over time. Put yourself in the place of the developer. You're a developer. I wonder if we have any developers. <laughs> Put yourself in the place of the developer. You buy land and you're, 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 you're contemplating whether or not. Uh, uh, what you want to do? Why? You decide to build some residential house, and then you learn that a new rent control statute has been enacted. Uh, well, one thing you might do is to not rent. You, you build it. You've already committed to building it. Let's assume you can sell those units as condos rather than rent them out. Because if you rent them out. You were subject to the whims of the rent control board in New York City. If they choose not to allow you to charge rents that will cover your cost, you have no recourse. The value of your investment shrinks. What you might do instead is if rather than use it as a rental unit, you sell it as condominiums. I recall seeing once I looked for it a few days ago and I couldn't find it. Maybe some of you know about it. And, and if my memory is not correct, it is a good economic research project for you, but I'm pretty sure I saw this study um, about 20 or 25 years ago. A study that looked at, so rent, rent control has been basically in effect in New York from the end of World War II until the present. It was around before that, but everyone started enforcing it seriously at the end of World War II. Uh, if you look at, uh, here's a study. So look at the uh, a severity of the New York City rent control board and look at what happens to condominium conversions. The study, as I remember it, is that as the severity of the rent control board increased, as, as the rent control board became uh, less likely to grant landlords the requested rental increase, and these, we do know this changes over time, sometimes a rental the New York City Rent Control Board is more lenient to landlords, sometimes much more strict toward landlords. Um, my guess is, I talked about this with Walter, uh, uh, so I'm sure the study exists, I remember he mentioned the study to me as well, that when the, the New York City Rent Control Board becomes more strict, the number of condominium conversions in New York City goes up 
And that makes sense, right? You're, you own a building, you have been renting it out to tenants, it's become more, becoming more and more difficult to have the tenants pay you an amount that covers your costs. So what can you do? You don't want to keep it as a rent, as, as, a, as a, a rental housing unit. You instead convert it to a condominium. Now you give your tenants, of course, first dibs on buying the units. But of course, people who are renting probably are renting for a reason. They don't have the wherewithal to put a down payment on buying a, 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 a residential unit. So rent control has this perverse effect of decreasing the supply of housing for relatively poor people, people of modest income, people who need to rent. It becomes less attractive for builders to build those kinds of units. It becomes less attractive for building owners to maintain those buildings as rental units. And it artificially increases the supply of owner-occupied housing. Artificially, it makes it artificially a little bit less expensive for people who can afford to buy housing to buy it. So George Clooney can buy a penthouse in New York, probably at a somewhat lower cost, somewhat lower price than he otherwise would have to pay were it not for New York City's rent control statutes. What happened in the 1960s, and we know this pretty well, what happened in the 1960s when the rent control board in New York was very strict is um, uh, the, the owners of these buildings in Harlem and the South Bronx, it became so unprofitable for them, they just abandoned them. Some of these owners were quite unscrupulous. So they hired arsonists to torch their buildings. They hired arsonists to torch their buildings. Think about that. You own a building in Manhattan, in New York City. This is should be prime real estate. And what are you doing? You're hiring an arsonist. You want to guess why they're hiring an arsonist? Insurance. 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 Some of them get caught. Not all of them, for sure. Some of them got caught. I got to get something out of it and get the insurance. These things get torched. They get gutted. The shells are still standing. And at least as recently as 20 years ago, from 30 or 40 years earlier, that still was the case. It looked like a blighted urban landscape in New York. This is one of my favorite quotations from all time. I know it's one of Pete's favorite quotations, too. And it's true. Short of aerial bombardment, the best way to destroy a city is through rent control. Rent control makes owning rental property unprofitable. Makes owning rental property, owning rental property unprofitable, less of it will be owned. And that which is owned is stricken by an incentive of its owners to be destroyed. See that in the actual data. Zoning. So this is a nasty sign from some number of years ago. But how does zoning? Zoning sounds good. It has a good name. Make sure that the, the neighborhood looks lovely. Minimum size lots. Uh, uh, Tom, you know all the zoning departments. I know you're a big fan of zoning. <laughs> um, uh, sounds nice. But if you want to exclude people of, of undesirable qualities from living in your neighborhood, people whose incomes aren't, aren't quite what you think they should be, one thing you could do is pass a statute. We don't want undesirable people living in our neighborhood. That won't pass constitutional muster today. You can't do that. What can you do? Well, you gussy up your nasty uh, impulses in a nice sounding term called zone. Oh, what a zone. It's going to make the neighborhood look nice. Minimum size lots. We'll give a minimum size lot. That's going to increase the minimum amount that has to be put down as a down payment to buy that lot. So zoning is another way, another, another one of these, these institutions that on its surface looks good, looks nice. It looks like it has wonderful effects. It looks like it's meant to serve the public interest. But in fact, it has... The impact, the impact it has is disproportionately against poor people. Blacks are disproportionately poor in America compared to whites, and therefore zoning has a disproportionate impact upon, upon blacks. Blacks are excluded from certain areas, not, not by uh, uh, invidious and explicit and pernicious prejudice and, and, and uh, uh, restrictive covenants. That's illegal. Those are illegal now. And, and look down upon. 
Blacks were excluded, poor people were excluded from a lot of places because of, of zoning. Uh, K through 12, that's the last one I'll mention, then I'll, I'll quit. K through 12 government school. So yesterday, um, Gary Hoover gave a, a nice talk about schooling in America, and he called it free and compulsory. It is compulsory. I wouldn't quite say it's free. It's, it's free in the sense that the parents who have children don't have to pay out-of-pocket expenses for the education, but of course, someone's got to pay for it. Taxpayers pay for it. Do the following exper mental experiment. Um, uh, suppose groceries were supplied in the same way we supply K through 12 education. And here's, here's how groceries would be supplied. Every resident in a town would be taxed a certain amount. Those taxes would be collected by the local grocery board. The grocery board would set up some grocery stores, use the tax proceeds to buy groceries. And, and, it, and it, but, but, but it'll be free. Everyone in the community would then get to go into the grocery store, into the supermarket and get stuff for free. Free groceries, tax the people. It, it, but you also, of course, can only let people who live in the tax district shop at that store because they are the ones who pay to stock it. And I think it doesn't take much imagination to understand that that's how we supply groceries. We have really, really poor supermarket service. We, we, we would have basically the Neanderthal version of supermarket services. And pardon me if I've insulted any Neanderthals. The incentive of the supermarket operators, the managers of the stores would be really poor indeed. They have a guaranteed customer base, people who live in the neighborhood. Those people are not spending their money voluntarily, it's being taxed. They're getting the money as a, as a stream of revenue from the fiscal authority. And then they, well, of course, they have to go through the motions of stocking the grocery store. Suppose they don't stock the grocery store, suppose they don't do a very good job. Yeah, the selection's not great, stores are kind of dirty. Where are you gonna go? Well, they have those really expensive private stores if you're rich. Shop at one of the expensive private stores, just got to pay to stock this store. So poor people have to shop at the really lousy government grocery store. To me, it seems like that is a terrible incentive for supplying groceries. We, we actually, the way we do it now, it, well, it's a, it's, it's a quotation from Walter. If the grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan wanted to sabotage black academic excellence, he could find, he could not find a more effective means uh, to do so, to do so you know, uh, uh, than uh, uh, the government school system that exists in many American cities. The, uh, <coughs> here is a graph showing from 1970 until 2012. The trend still continues, but I couldn't find a, a, a a better graph than this one, some of more recent graph. Um, the, the total cost of operating schools is that highly steeped line. Um, the number of employees is the next steep line. And then reading scores, math scores, and science scores are these lines. So, uh, uh, and, and these are adjusted for inflation. So expending on schooling has gone up. K through 12 schooling has gone way up. The number of employees in K through 12 schooling has gone way up. There's no impact at all, no discernible impact on the performance of K through 12 schooling. I think the reason that there is no impact is because the people who run K through 12 schools have no incentive to supply a better product. In fact, their incentives are all the worse. Think about the incentive of K through 12 schools. Pay attention to the news. Well, our children are not being educated well. Our kids can't read. Our kids can't, they don't know history. Our kids, if we have discipline problems in the school. What do the public school administrators say? We need more money. And that makes sense to a lot of people. They don't think about it very much. Oh, it must be funding. Let's start a lottery and give proceeds to the school. Let's raise taxes and give proceeds to the school. Now, this incredibly perverse system now. In K through 12 schooling, 
in which the incentives for the, for the people who run the schools are actually to run them poorly, because the more poorly they run the schools, the better is their case for increased funding. It'd be like me as a college professor, uh, 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 being able to, to uh, claim that, well, yeah, my failure to show up for class, uh, my habit of showing up drunk, my uh, failure to get grades in on time, I'm just not paid enough. Oh, you're right, we're gonna pay you more in order to prevent you from engaging in that terrible activity. Thank you. Next semester comes around, I still don't show up for class. I still don't get my grades in on time. When I do show up for class, I'm still high on some mysterious substance. Uh, I need more money, yes you do. That's the kind of incentive, that's the kind of incentive system we have going on, I think, in K-12 school. Walter was fond of pointing out, Walter was fond of pointing out, so look around, look at the places where minorities are served really well. Supermarkets are one of them, this is his example. It's not his picture, this is an example. Supermarkets are one of them. Anybody with access to supermarkets can serve really well in supermarkets. Government schooling is not one of them. And the reason, Walter argued, is that the incentives facing the people who supply supermarkets and supermarket services were very different, much better than are the incentives of people who supply K-12 government school. People who supply K-12 government school have a captive audience. Again, they have captive customers. And they're going to get paid regardless of how well or how poorly they do their job. You run a supermarket, you don't have captive customers. You don't run your supermarket well, your customers go elsewhere. I'll end with this quotation from Walter. There are lots. I, I struggled to find one that was appropriate to end. This was a very quotable writer. And I'm sorry, in, in, in mine, it was, it was actually get out of the, the, uh, the possibly. Click one, click one more. Off the All right. The relative colorblindness of the market accounts for much of the hostility towards it. The markets have a notorious lack of respect for privileged race and class structures. There is a theme that runs through the entire life work of Walter Williams from the 1960s through uh, the through 2020. I'm still writing until he died. It's this theme. It's the theme that says that the incentive structure in competitive markets overrides any bad intentions. The incentive structure operating in politics overrides any good intentions. And so if we replace, to the extent that we replace markets with government, to the extent that we replace market provision with government provision, to the extent that we replace private financing with tax funded financing, we replace a system of of good incentives with a system of bad incentives. That, I think, is appropriately called systematic or systemic racism. And Walter wouldn't call it that, but it's pretty systemic because the, 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 the people who are harmed most, of course, by these bad policies, by these dysfunctional policies, by these poor incentives, are people who can least afford to escape them, and those are the poorest people amongst us and blacks still have much lower average incomes than do whites. And I'll shut up there and let you ask some questions. Thank you. I just have a question about the minimum wage. Uh, what do you think of some of the sort of natural experiment uh, studies that come out and say, well, we would expect minimum wages to lead to uh, job losses, but uh, actually, actually have. Yeah, so like the most famous one being Cardi Kruger, 1994. So what he's referring to is, so until the mid 1990s, I think it's fair to say there was a consensus among the economists that, that the minimum, raising the minimum wage had a small but real negative impact on the number of jobs open to low-skilled workers. 
There was a famous study done in 19, it was released in 1981. It was, it was, it was commissioned by President Carter. Uh, and I think the finding was a 10% increase in the real minimum wage resulted in a 1% decrease in employment for low skilled workers. A little small, but real. Uh, starting in 19, that was the consensus until the mid 1990s. In 1994, a famous paper was published by uh, the late Alan Kruger and David Carr, who's a recent recipient of the Nobel Prize in economics, claiming to show, at least finding evidence in one particular market, that raising the minimum wage doesn't have a negative impact on employment. In 1992, so New, as, as, as you know, New Jersey and Pennsylvania share a border with each other. Right? Just the, the Delaware River separate, separates them. And so it, it's a very small river. So it's pretty much the same place. But one's New Jersey, one is, is, is Pennsylvania. New Jersey is going to raise its minimum wage. Pennsylvania is keeping its minimum wage the same. And so therefore, it's a natural experiment. If minimum wage goes up, in one jurisdiction, but stays the same in another jurisdiction, we should detect in the jurisdiction which the minimum wage rises, New Jersey, we should detect the negative employment impact. Cardin Kruger famously found that it did not have that impact. But, and, and since the Cardin Kruger study was published in the American Economic Review, which is the most prestigious journal uh, you know, in economics, it, has a, it, it carries a lot of weight. Since that study was published, there's been, an, I think it's called the New, uh, the new, the new, the new, new Labor Economics, it has a name. A number of studies have emerged that claim to support the Card Kruger finding. So there's been this ongoing debate for a quarter of a century in the economics profession. Who's right, Card and Kruger and the people who follow them or the more traditional view uh, that, that dates back since the economists started to, to, to analyze minimum wages. One study that I find convincing is a paper done a number of years ago, two or three years ago, by uh, David Newmark and William Washer, where they looked at uh, uh, a whole slew of studies on the minimum wage done, I, I think, since 2005 to maybe 2015, something like that. Don't quote me on years, they found that 70%, 70% of these studies find a negative impact. So 30% don't, 70% do. I don't know if that's sufficient to say, well, the consensus was, was, was correct and Carter and Kruger are wrong. This paper by uh, uh, Newmark and Washer has been criticized. Uh, people said, well, they, how, how do they determine what, what, is, what is a good study? Maybe they, they excluded from their, their uh, uh, sample studies that they regard as, as being too incompetent, but those are the ones that supported Cardin and Kruger. Who knows? I, uh, uh, but I think here's what Walter has said about Walter, because I've talked to, actually talked to Walter a lot about this. Uh, 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 he, he would, he, he loved to repeat a statement made famous by his best friend, uh, Tom Sowell, reality is not optional. And he said, look, you, you, you cannot raise the cost of hiring workers and not get some negative impact. It, it's got to show up somewhere. Right? So it may show up in a reduced number of jobs, but if it doesn't, it's got to show up in reduced fringe benefits. The job itself becomes more onerous. There's got to be some negative impact. Uh, and, and, the, and the only way, of course, that's not true is if it's a, it, it's, it's a monopsony, which Cardin Kruger tried to say, well, really there, there's monopsony in those, in those markets. Just while we're on this topic, I will mention Jeffrey Clemens published a nice paper last year in one of the American Economic Association journals. I forget which one. They have a little slew of journals now uh, uh, on the minimum wage, and he finds that he, he he tried to look at impacts of the minimum wage beyond number of jobs, the changes in the quality of jobs. He, he finds that the standard economic analysis holds on that on that front. Um, but the 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 Cardin Kruger claim though, as, as you probably know, it came very famous very quickly because it is a claim that lots of people want to hear. I remember very distinctly reading the New York Times 
1995. Carl Drucker was published, I think, in December of 1994. 1995, there's a debate in Congress about the minimum, about raising the minimum wage. One member of Congress back then, in fact, I think it was a House Majority Whip, Dick Arm, he was an economist uh, uh, from the University of North Texas. He was in Congress at the time. He was a pretty good economist. So he's speaking out on Capitol Hill against raising the minimum wage. So that's going to you know, increase increase uh, employment, uh, increase unemployment. And the New York Times writes, I can't remember the reporter's name, the New York Times writes, uh, well, Congressman Army says that raising the minimum wage will increase unemployment. Economists beg to differ and just cites the Cardi Kruger thing as if it was an established, you know, uh, incontestable fact. It's, it, 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 it's, it's still, it's still on, on the debate, I think is still ongoing, but in my mind, I, 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 I don't put much stock in the card. I have one more story to tell about this if no one has any other questions. Do we have a... No, that's me asking for questions. Um, that could be mm -hmm. So one of the, one of the uh, 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 major players in this minimum wage debate now is a University of Massachusetts Amherst economist, Aaron Project Dubé, who's an incredibly good econometrician, really skilled at doing econometrics. So I was asked to debate him about five or six years ago at Dartmouth. And so I want to be really prepared. So I, I go to Dartmouth and debate Aaron Project Dubé. And uh, it wasn't quite fair. It turns out I was the one supporting the traditional economics. That Dubé and some other economists on the other side, so it was two against one. That's okay. I feel I had the stronger point. Anyway, so the debate was civil. I, I thought I made some pretty good points. I'm sure they, my, my opponents thought that they made some pretty good points as well. There's a QA after. And one of the questions, you weren't there, but you have to trust me, I have a PhD, I'm trustworthy. One of the questions <laughs> was this person stands in the back of the room. And says, I have a question for both Professor Boudreau and Professor Dubé, and whatever those, this woman's name was, the other person on, on Aaron Dubé's side. The person says, um, uh, Senator Sanders is talking about raising the minimum wage to $15. And I want to know if either of you are willing to predict what impact that will have on the employment of low skilled workers. And so the moderator pointed to me first, Don, I said, it's going to raise the unemployment rate of low skilled workers. I said, I don't know by how much, but I guarantee you, if the minimum wage rises from $7.25 an hour by a, what is 106% to $15 an hour, it's going to have a negative impact on employment. I feel pretty confident about that. Let's do that. We don't know. We've never done an experiment like this before. So we can't say. This is only we get some theory that allowed us to get some some insight to what might happen if the minimum wage rose. I didn't think about it until afterward, but I was telling another friend of mine about, about this exchange. And so the friend of mine was very smart. He said, you know what you should have said? He said, you should have said, well, you know, we've never experimented with exploding a nuclear warhead above Manhattan. So we don't know what would happen. If we explode a nuclear warhead over Manhattan, would it kill people? Maybe, maybe not. We've never done it before. It's pretty clear it would it, 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 it would happen. The the I'll, I'll I'll end on this. One of the problems I have with this new research on the minimum wage, and it's a problem that Walter had with it as well. He actually wrote on it, is uh, it it elevates naive empiricism above clear thinking. I think it just elevates. It, it's not it's not an argument against empirical research, but it is an argument. It, 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 the problem I have with, with, the, with, with that research is just says, you know, we're just going to gather these data and, and we're just going to take them at face value. We're not going to ask about other possible impacts. We're not going to ask about time, time lengths. We're just going to gather data. And all the, all the research now, all the debate now, as you, as you might know, is it's not on the economics of the minimum wage. It's on very esoteric topics of how to do the econometrics. And all the economics has been forgotten. It's, it's all about specification models and you know, differences and differences and differences and differences on some, some end result. And the economics has been lost. 
and and and, and I, I know that 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 because well, you shared with me, that's one reason why I walk around the country we constantly lament the poor state of the economics profession you know lament the, 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 the direction in which it was going that people were forgetting how to use simple basic economics to better understand the world and get lost in high level mathematics and high level econometrics metrics however useful those things are they certainly are in many cases uh, if you don't have a good grounding and solid basic economics you're not going to be a very good economist you're not going to be very good economic research you're certainly not going to write sound economic policy and if you look at walter williams entire life history i think he never lost sight of sound basic economics and all the policy advice that i know that he gave uh, I, I believe was always grounded in, in 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 good economics and hence it was it was solid economic advice whether or not you agree with it in the end thank you well thank you all um I mentioned tomorrow afternoon is our next event. We're coming back to the struggle to be having a panel. Actually, take T202. We're going to have a, a, a panel on criminal justice reform. Uh, we've got three really great speakers to talk on that topic. And then tomorrow night, uh, we're back in this room for Rachel Ferguson on um, black liberalization in the marketplace. So, hope you'll come back up uh, to join us and uh, have a good evening.